Chapter 1 Iodva began to descend towards the horizon, as the sounds of cannon fire continued to cover the incessant clashing of steel and xylite. The battle between Lerone's 6th Marine Expeditionary Force and Brenwell's 3rd Naval Fleet had been going on since the watchful sun goddess hovered mid-sky. Iodva seemed to favour neither side at this point, as there had been no clear victor. Lord Renwalt Lodenmore stood on the deck of the Salvonian flagship, the Pira Salvante, and observed the mosaic of ships, men, and beasts engaged in savage battle across the Caruvian Sea. He had hoped to land his expeditionary forces onto the shores of Lerone before his fleet could be spotted, but the crafty forces of Yaquelnor were more vigilant than he had anticipated. The third fleet was intercepted off midway between Salvonia and Lorone. Part of him hated remaining on the deck of his vessel, for it was a relatively safe place. The inferior Lorone harpoons and cannons could never reach him at this distance, and he always found himself feeling a tinge of guilt for remaining so far back from the real danger. He was getting older, but part of him longed for the earlier days of battle he had experienced in his youth. As commander of the Third Fleet, he had an obligation to stay alive and direct forces to victory, but he also could not avoid the desire to swing his sword one last time in battle. His young men and women were out there risking their lives for their nation. Many of them were surely slain, torn apart by vicious thraklovs, mauled by the savage Malfoury, or simply run through by the Xelite swords carried by the Lerone marines. The Admiral turned to his second in command, Captain Grayshaw, and commented on the enemy's strategy. They remain close to our ships as an opponent with an axe does to a spear-wielder. Beyond the reach of our cannons, sir, indeed, Grayshaw replied. Their swords are made of superior metal. Even plate armor offers little protection. Still, the men will have to hold them off for a while longer, prepare the fleet to rapidly head west towards Salvonia when the signal is given, Captain. We're retreating? Grayshaw appeared bewildered, as they still possessed significant forces to fight on to victory. No. But why not let the enemy believe that we are, the Admiral replied. Though outnumbered, our ships are faster and possess superior cannon range. Once their vessels are at the maximum range of our own weapons, raise the flag to open fire. We won't sink all their vessels, but we can damage enough of them such that they will have to halt a pursuit. We will regroup at the rendezvous point just east of Brenwell and resupply. Sir, they will view this as a retreat. We must not show weakness, or surely it will encourage a larger-scale invasion force. Renwalt rubbed his beard and pondered the words of his friend and subordinate. If the Third Fleet is destroyed here this day, there won't be anything to stop, or even delay a larger invasion force from sailing right onto the shores of Salvonia. This is a fight for the survival of our way of life. We must be practical and not prideful. Withdrawal is not weakness. It is tactically sound. Grayshaw seemed disappointed and remained silent as he considered the shame he felt for having to order a retreat. Do you understand? the Admiral asked. Aye, Admiral, I understand. Good, because you will have to command the fleet one day, perhaps sooner than you expected. Not too soon, I hope, he replied. One thing that still bothers me about a withdrawal, sir. How do we pull back without significant attrition? Maintaining our defensive position allows us to at least cut some of their forces down. They have three times the ships we have. Once we attempt to withdraw, they will open fire on our backs with their weapons. At this range, our own guns aren't much of an advantage. The Admiral had considered this, but knew that the enemy's pursuit was less important than securing the foundation of their fleet. The Argonautica is their flagship vessel. Lord Renwalt pointed at the large vessel with the highest mast several meters to the southeast. 
It's quite powerful, but it also carries munitions, food, medical supplies, and infantry. Like all flagships, it also serves as a representative of the nation's sea power out here far from their homeland. If we manage to sink their flagship vessel, it will have a demoralizing effect on their men in the short run and give them pause. Grayshaw nodded in approval. Their command structure would have to relocate to another vessel as well, sir. It could work, but that ship is quite large and well armored. Further, there are several ships between the fleet and the Argonautica. A clear shot is virtually impossible. Well, I guess we'll have to destroy it the old-fashioned way. He turned to his friend and smiled. We'll need to employ a sapper team to destroy it like you to do back in the old days. It's been a while since I made the swim with explosives, Admiral, but I can still get the job done. Their flagship will rest upon the bottom of the sea this day, sir. I'll see it done personally. The Admiral shook his head in disapproval. No. Assign the task to Podhurst. He is a more than capable officer and trained with air-sealed Leffel bombs. Let him assemble his own team. I need you to remain here while I say hello to an old friend and distract them. Let the explosion of their flagship itself be the signal for the tactical withdrawal to the west. The other captains will regroup at Stolwyn Point, where you will make your next stand. You're boarding the Argonautica yourself? Grayshaw's response was a mix of surprise and concern. You have an obligation to protect your people as well, don't you? Renwalt removed his dagger from its sheath and handed it to the worried captain. If I do not return, give this to my daughter, he said. Captain Grayshaw takes the unblemished dagger with a blue stone embedded within the handle. He began to understand his superior's true intentions that day. On some level, he was aware of the desire that all warriors possess to give their lives, but this was more than just desire. This was a necessity for the revered fleet commander. I'll make sure she gets it, Renwalt. I promise. For Salvonia, Admiral Renwalt extended his hand to his friend while looking him in the eyes for what might be the last time. For Salvonia. He grabbed his hand and embraced Admiral Renwalt as a true friend would. Admiral Renwalt placed his helmet upon his head and drew his greatsword. He had named it Malak, which was an ancient word meaning deadly. Malak, much like his family dagger, also had a blue stone at the base. It was longer than some women were tall and crafted with materials that seemed to defy reality. He only hoped that if he fell in battle, somehow the sword would find its way back to his family. Leaving it with Greyshaw was not an option, as he would need his primary weapon if he were to reach the enemy fleet commander. Getting to the Argonautica would not be easy, but he knew that his destiny lay on the deck of that ship. He had seen it many times before in his dreams, while slumbering within Hal Godum's citadel. As he crossed the plank, from his own flagship to the next vessel, he could hear the sounds of battle growing. It was not a sound he was a stranger to, although he had not heard it for quite some time. As he crossed the deck of the first connecting ship, the al Herbar, he could begin to smell the stench of death nearby. He saw men crossing swords on the ships nearby. The winds were blowing eastward, which would make a withdrawal towards Brenwell more difficult but it would also make a pursuit harder for the enemy. Right now he was thinking that the westerly winds did much to mask the death stench, but this would end soon as he continued moving across the ship decks. He stepped off the Al Herba and onto the deck of the Radiant Serpent, which was a ship designed for speed and firepower, but had virtually no armor and was made of mostly pine with little metal. Here he could taste the hatred in the air as men clashed weapons. A marine bearing the emblem of Yaquanor charged him with a raised short sword, but one of the Admiral's loyal sailors cut the would-be assassin down with an axe strike to the head. The spray of blood onto the deck as the axe was withdrawn served as an unpleasant welcome to the horrors of close combat that the aging Admiral had avoided for so long. 
Still, being this close to death made him feel more alive than ever. He placed a hand upon the sailor's right shoulder in thanks and continued to move across the deck towards the center of the battlefield made of wooden vessels. His loyal men naturally created a tunnel of protection around the moving admiral. They had never seen him step into the fray of combat, but they knew they did not wish to see him fall. He turned to the closest sailor he could find. It was a tall, armored warrior bearing the emblem of Salvonia upon his chest. There were several blood smears and dents on his armor, suggesting that he had contributed more than his fair share of service to Brenwell. Are we pushing forward, Admiral? he asked. What's your name, sailor? I'm called Naluk, sir. N Naluk, make your way to the rear and tell the other men not to follow me towards their flagship. I'll be heading onto their vessels alone once I leave the Nethrozoon. Am I clear, Neluk? Yes. Yes, Admiral. As the Admiral moved toward the edge of the Radiant Serpent, he could finally begin to smell something that he had not expected to smell this far out to sea. The malodorous presence of unclean feathers and wet fur entered his nostrils as he stepped off of the Radiant Serpent and onto the Nethrozoon. He instinctively raised his left gauntlet to deflect an arrow gliding towards his forehead. Seasoned warriors often seemed to possess a sixth sense after several battles that the novices did not comprehend. This seemingly magical awareness had saved his life more times than he could remember, but he knew that it came with a price, and his time was short. With fewer men to protect him on this ship, for the first time in years, Admiral Renwalt found himself having to raise his sword in the service of his nation. With one clean swipe, he removed the head of a particularly large thrakloff. Its body continues to run across the deck as its disembodied head twitched upon the blood-stained deck of the Nethrozoon. He continued to move, but found that the number of Salvonian sailor bodies was increasing as he progressed. An arrow struck his breastplate and fell to the ground as he stepped off of the Nethrozoon and on the first enemy vessel. He could read the name of the ship at the foot of the bridge. Listavante. Interesting name for a ship, he said to himself. There was a dead Malpharus on the main deck, and upon setting foot there, additional marines from the ships to the east began to board the Listavante. He looked to his rear and saw several of his men approaching to aid him, but he raised his palm to halt their advance. Despite Neluk's delivery of his orders, the men could not resist the desire to aid their leader, but they also understood that a fleet admiral's commanders were practically sacrosanct when given directly. Hay halted their advance and remained behind, as instructed by his gestures from a distance. He turned to face his front, just in time to block an attack from a particularly short female combatant with a very long spear. He hated having to kill a young woman, even in the heat of battle. He grabbed the spear and incapacitated her with a headbutt, and she fell unconscious to the deck. Despite his age, the Admiral was a merciful and efficient fighter. Years of swinging steel have honed his skill into an almost supernatural force, but he knew that fatigue would set in, and he had hoped to find his intended target before his good fortune reached its end. The technique he learned years ago involved removing the enemy's weapon-wielding limb and finishing him off with a thrust to the heart or spine if his back were turned. Most swordsmen paid so much attention to protecting their bodies that they often ignored their hands and wrists, which were typically easy targets for novice fighters. More of the Lerone Marines approached him, but none of them were a match for the Admiral's skill with a blade. One by one, he cut them down as he made his way towards the Argonautica. His long sword sliced through tendons and ligaments, leaving a trail of body parts behind him until he finally reached a wall of defensive marines which stood ready but did not attack the proud Salvonian commander. Was this out of respect, he thought? 
They outnumber me, and this is their best chance to finish me off. Why cease their assault? I did not cut through your pawns only to be shown mercy. Do your worst warriors of Lorone. Salvonia will never yield to the tyranny of Yakvon and the traitorous Tillman. What do you know of Tillman? The admiral heard a voice shout out from behind the wall of marines. I'd recognize that voice anywhere. Renwalt chuckled and wiped the blood from his sword with his blade cloth. He sheathed his sword and opened his arms. Are you ready for your rematch, little brother? Once brothers in bond, not blood, old friend. Admiral Felvenhart, the commander of the Lorone Expeditionary Force, emerged from a divide of marines protecting his position. It's good to see you again, though. Indeed it is. We have much to discuss, dear so. Let's stop this madness before more lives are lost. You say this after personally slicing several of my men into pieces. Your cannon's initial volley ripped apart so many of our sailors and marines that the chunks of guts and organs remain on the decks as we speak. We have had no time to sanitize our vessels. You have some nerve, Rennie. Me? You have some nerve. Yakvon is responsible for this invasion with Tillman, providing significant support. In past times, there is no way Lorone would resort to the employment of these beasts in combat, which have clearly been corrupted by some twisted spell. Our expedition was initially sent to discuss terms for peace. It was not until our own operatives informed us of a massive Lorone fleet sailing towards us from the northeast that we attacked. Even then, it was only because of Lorone's treaty violation. Some of your scout vessels have been observed sailing within ten ebonths of our continental shelf. Are you going to stand there and pretend that King Betvan had no plans to eventually attack Lorone and seize our nation's natural resources for himself? You've fallen for your new ruler's lies, Dersord, hook, line, and sinker, as your mother used to say. You don't get to talk about her. Admiral Felvenhart approached his old friend, but kept his sword sheathed. You think I wanted her to die the way she did? I had nothing to do with what happened. You may not have killed her or my father, Rennie, but it was the Salvonian men that destroyed the Judenhawk. It was a civilian vessel. Aye, it was, dear Sode, but it was, in fact, transporting food stocks from Lorone to Varkalzunia during the war, dear Sode, and you know it. I was only a lieutenant in those days, you know this as well. Even if I had been in charge of the Salvonian defense, I could not have prevented the attack on a civilian vessel so far from the capital ship. Perhaps, but you still fight for them now, don't you, brother? Don't you see that Yakvon has used the death of all your loved ones as a propaganda tool? He doesn't care about any of you, not like the whole Sonai family did. What do you know of them? I only met Kristonavarian once, but he struck me as a man of honor and wisdom. Were he still in charge of your regime, this war would never have even begun. You're wrong, old friend. There would still have been war. The only difference is that, under Yakvon, we are now the ones dictating its beginning. Admiral Felvenhart drew his long sword from his sheath and stared into Renwalt's eyes. And its end, and waved his hand in a circle at the wall of marines behind him. You really wanted to end this way, Derso? We grew up together. We used to build forts out of rotting tree branches and sticks. Our parents were best friends. Fighting you would be like fighting family. My real family is dead, Rennie. I'm only giving you a chance to get out of this alive, because, contrary to what you might think, I do possess honor, and I hope to maintain it, which is why I need you to draw your sword. Renwalt hesitated for a moment, despite being prepared to defend himself. He had expected to fight, but didn't anticipate the sorrow he'd feel in his heart when faced with the prospect of having to kill his friend. Draw your sword, Sir Renwalt. In truth, I always knew this day would come, Admiral Renwalt said. We both did. 
Felvenhart assumed his defensive stance with his sword and began to circle his most formidable adversary. He removed his battle helmet and looked down at the sword resting within Renwalt's sheath. I know that your family blade is of quality metal as is my own. My final promise to you is that your daughter will receive the Lodenmore blade unspoiled should you lose this battle today. Renwalt drew his sword and prepared himself by removing his helmet so that his face could be clearly seen. Lids Navai, man's drags, he said. Lids Navai, man's drags, Felvenhart replied. Renault's strikes were heavy and difficult to block. He had learned years ago to use the weight of both his weapon and armor to provide additional force. A weaker opponent would have been unable to deflect the attacks at all, but Felvenhart was no novice. The white hairs growing within his beard were well earned. He understood that allowing his opponent's blade to strike close to the hilt reduced its motion the best, though it increased the risk of losing one's fingers. A skilled and experienced swordsman knew how to balance this risk, however. Renwalt was strong, but Felvenhart was faster and was able to occasionally dodge a swipe at his neck. He thrusted his sword at Renwalt's joints, but never connected. Both men became fatigued after nearly a minute of relentless swinging and dodging. Yodva grew closer to Erishmar's horizon as their blades continued to clash. How long can you keep this up, old man? I am only two years your senior, little brother. Renwalt replied, I can last as long as you can. There is plenty of the goddesses' light still left in this day. I'm glad you think so. I'm about to send you off for a personal encounter with her. Felvenhart knew that the longer the fight waged on, the greater the possibility of a steel Salvonian cannonball tearing through the ship and destroying the symbol of Lorone power within the region. He had begun to suspect that Renwalt was up to something clever the moment he stepped onto the ship and that this was more than just a personal duel. Felvenhart decided to risk defeat by trying to thrust his Xelite blade as hard as he could into Renwalt's plate armor, which was constructed of less than superb material, enough to protect from glancing blows or weak thrusts, but not enough to defend a warrior from a full drive with the strength of both arms. He tightened his grip around his weapon and poured every ounce of his body's energy into pushing his blade as fast and as hard as he could at Renwalt's chest. Time seemed to slow down as he moved forward with the attack. He truly loved his old friend and secretly longed for the old days when they drank ale, argued over women, and feasted upon zaffron ribs. Felvenhart knew those days would never return, however. They were both older men with duties to their warring nations, and only one of them was going to get out of this battle alive. He had preferred that it was himself. Predictable as ever, little brother. Renwalt spun with the nimbleness of a teenager to dodge the assault, and hit Felvenhart on his backside, adding to the momentum from his own failed attack. Dersard nearly fell forward, but was able to find his balance. He turned around to face a well-honed blade inches away from his windpipe. Finish this, Felvenhart said, as he dropped his sword. Just end this, Rennie. I know how to die with my honor intact. You know that I could never hurt you, Dersault? Renwalt lowered his own blade and picked up his helmet from the ground. I'd sooner hurt myself. The next time we meet, it won't be in this world, little brother. It will be in the next, unless we end this war right here, right now. Don't be Yakvon's pawn. Order your forces to withdraw back to Lerone, and with our combined forces, we can end his tyranny now, before things get worse. He turned his back to his friend and his opponent to step away from the ship. I'm heading back to the Piracelvonte, de so. The next move is yours. Indeed, it is old friend, de so replied. Renwalt took one more step, but then froze in place. 
he began to taste the blood erupting from his esophagus as Felvenhart's blade ran past Admiral Lodenmore's armor and through his stomach. I'm sorry, Rennie. I have to end this now, brother. You should have never stepped on board. He removed the sword from his friend's back and watched him turn around to face his executioner. Don't worry, Rennie. Salvonia will fall under our control, but its people will be treated with compassion. I have no doubt of this. I know that you believe this, Desso. I know you want that to be true, Renwald said with a forced whisper. He was quickly losing blood, which was trickling down his armor and onto the deck. I meant what I said about your sword and your daughter. I swear that she will receive the blade, unspoiled and in a timely manner. She will come for you one day, Desode. I would never harm her, Rennie. You know this. I would sooner harm myself. Predictable as ever. Renwalt began to laugh as if a court jester had recently slipped on a rotten Ispungu peel. Blood ran down the sides of his mouth, and the cackling exacerbated the pain. But he couldn't help but find Dersoft's comments amusing. You think I'm actually worried about my daughter's Derso? Did you forget about Mildred as well? Felvenhart seemed confused and moved closer to Renwalt to better hear his final words. I'm more worried about what they're going to do to you once they discover who killed their father. You should pray to Riku that you die in the blast so that my progeny doesn't find you. Goodbye, old friend. A sudden revelation occurred to Admiral Fievenhart after receiving Renwalt's final farewell. Abandon ship. Felvenhart turned to observing marines who seemed puzzled at an order which made little sense to them as the cannon fire had ceased. Get off of the ship. Now. Move! Felvenhart grabbed Renwalt's sword and lifted the dead admiral's body up from the deck. He pulled both into the waters of the Caravan Sea only moments before the Argonautica's bow exploded. The shockwave from the blast disrupted his sense of hearing, and the ringing within his ears began. The smell of lethal dust told him all that he needed to know about the explosion's cause. Amongst the pieces of shattered wood and floating debris, he was able to find an empty barrel to latch onto. The weight of both his own armor and his dead friend's body made it difficult to stay afloat, even with the buoyancy of the barrel. But these weights paled in comparison to the weight that now rested upon his heart. As Idova dipped beneath the path of Zorin, Admiral Felvenhart felt more alone in that moment than he had ever felt in his entire life. His last true friend was now dead, killed by his own sword. He wasn't sure if being the executioner gave him more comfort or was to be a source of torture for his remaining days. If he did ever encounter Renwald's daughter, he doubted her would be able to look her in the face and not feel some sense of shame.